we all don't realize how many assumptions we make in a relationship or really in life in general, right? We make a lot of assumptions about how things are supposed to be. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's your host, Eileen. So today's episode is all about how to have healthier relationships, the keys to building stronger and more resilient relationships in your life. So today we're focusing on talking about partnerships and romantic relationships, but really these tips can apply to any relationship in your life. Our guest today is Yola Yovani. Yola Yovani is a dedicated personal and relationship coach and is committed to helping individuals enhance self-love and improve their connections with others. Recognizing that love is a powerful force, she emphasizes the importance of cultivating skills for sustaining healthy relationships. Hello, Yola. Welcome to the podcast. How are you feeling today? Hi, Eileen. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. I'm, you know, uh, happy to have this conversation with you and really glad and honored that you invited me. Yeah, of course. So why don't we start with what drew you to become a relationship coach? So uh, I feel like many little things kept leading me down this path throughout my life. Um, I've always been interested in psychology since I first came into contact with it while obtaining my bachelor's degree. I was studying business and economics, and I started taking some psychology courses just to feel it out. I was I noticed that I was interested in it. I also took some child development courses, and immediately I fell in love with it, and you know I just couldn't get enough of it. So... From there, it was a lot of kind of just picking up books written by psychologists and self-educating just because it became my interest at that point in time. And after that, I continued with my career kind of in economics and the corporate world. And while I was in that dynamic, you know, eventually I did meet my now husband. Um, but that relationship came with challenges, right? He, it is a blended family. So he came with two kids from a previous marriage and there was a lot to navigate there. And at some point it just became overwhelming. Um, to figure that out. I kept running through these same thoughts in my mind over and over again. Um, and honestly, I felt like I was going a little crazy. So I really just wanted somebody to talk to. Um, and so that's when I entered therapy. And I lucked out. My therapist was lovely, uh, really supportive, very skilled at what she did. And, you know, we immediately had a good rapport, I felt. And I think that's so important in that type of dynamic. Um, the rapport with the therapist really matters for the work that you're doing and to be vulnerable and to be open and to uh, advance further in that process. So just the process of therapy completely opened my mind. It rearranged my thinking. It challenged core beliefs. It was just so nice for me. Um, and also the practicality of it. There was a big component of just learning tools in terms of, uh, you know, just minuscule changes you could implement that would make a big difference in terms of your relationship, in terms of how you do things, how you communicate, and how these microscopic changes, and sometimes they're not that small, uh, these changes that you implement in your life, they eventually change the interaction between the two of you, the feel of the relationship. It has quite a downstream impact. And so it was really cool to build up that knowledge. And from doing that, I realized that, you know what, I do need to get back to this. I love this. And I want to be a part of that positive change in armoring people with these tools. So, you know, I learned, I went and I learned what it means to be a coach. And, you know, I, 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 I learned about that. And currently I'm also pursuing a master's degree in psychology. So uh, that's kind of what I'm doing as, you know, to expand my my knowledge and my love of the subject and coaching clients at the same time. Amazing. So next question is, why don't we start with what do you believe are the keys to a healthy and strong relationship? I think, I think there's a few different things. I think you have to be able to joke with your partner. I think you have to have some humor in the relationship. Um, you have to have a little bit of lightness in the relationship uh, and not take yourself too seriously because there's no such thing as a perfect person and there's no such thing as a perfect relationship. And so I think that's a really beautiful quality to have and it goes a long way. Um, it helps to have similar values um, and it helps to really be aligned in, in a lot of those areas. The more your values are conflicting, the more space you have to create uh, for the other person, right? The more you have to kind of 
be mindful that they think differently, the more you have to navigate that, the more, you know, if, especially if they're quite strong differences, whether it's religious differences or parenting or this, that, and the other. And so um, the more kind of tiptoeing you start to do and the more room there is for issues to rise. Um, so having actually mostly similar values can really help for the relationship to go well. And I think the last thing I would say on that is just really turning towards your partner. Um, so, and that's a Gottman turn. It's like the bits for connection. So it's really about uh, when your partner engages you, paying attention to that, you know, being interested in what they have to say, um, because that's why you're there, right? You're there to be seen. You're there to feel heard. You're there to really feel nurtured in that dynamic and feel a sense of connection. And so making sure that overall, um, you are responsive to your partner when they reach out to you uh, really is really quite important. Yeah, that's something simple, but I know a lot of people struggle with that as well, just feeling seen in their own relationship. Yeah, for sure. Yes. What are some of the most common issues that you've noticed working with couples? You know, a lot of couples will come to me and they'll tell me, and I've made videos about this one too. So a lot of couples will come to me and they'll tell me they have a communication issue. And while that may tr might be true, there are some communication barriers. There's normally also a connection issue. And so the relationship needs to be prioritized, right? So uh, when you're living life with someone, it may seem like you do everything together and you're spending all of this time together, but often that can be quite passive right? And you actually need to create like a slot in your day or in your week where you are actually focused on each other and you have conscious attention on each other. You are doing things together. Um, and it's really great if you're trying out new things together, uh, because when you are, you know, learning, experimenting with something new, you're in a place of vulnerability, you're in a place of openness um, as you learn. And so your partner gets to see you in a different light. They get to connect with that vulnerability. Um, so there's a lot of great opportunity there to feel like you're growing together, to feel like you are closer, to feel that you prioritize each other and care about each other. And to also even build a sense of kind of reliability that you will be there for each other as you learn new things together or navigate challenges together or whatever it might be. I think it's also really great in terms of knowing that when you have uh, arguments and when you have issues, you have opportunities in the relationship where the relationship is a priority so that you can address those types of things, right? You don't feel that there's this avoidance happening in the relationship. So yeah, I, I really believe that creating opportunities and slots in your calendar for your relationship, you know, weekly, mm -hmm. whatever, check-ins, these things can go a really long way until they become more normalized in the relationship. And just to feel that there is that uh, conscious attention to what's going on between the two of you. Right. You're saying it's typically a, a common issue is just the lack of connection and the lack of making time for each other, right? Yes, absolutely. So it's, yeah, so there are definitely usually communication mishaps and most people do believe they have communication issues. Um, but what I find is it's kind of cyclical, right? So um, when you have good communication, you're more likely to kind of interact with each other because mm -hmm. you feel like you can resolve things. Yeah. And the more you interact with each other, the more aware you are of each other, the more you know about each other, you learn things about each other. Um, and so that can lead to actually better communication, even without needing to pick up too many tools to, mm. to, to really work on that. I see. I see. It's more of like where you direct your energy to. Like if you direct energy and prioritize your relationship, then the communication will naturally flow better. It's not the communication yeah. issue. It's the attention and priority issue. Yes, it's a big one. It's a big one. It's a bit of both, but yes, that one is huge. And I think we tend to to overlook that. It's so challenging. I mean, there, people also have really rough schedules and that's something to be mindful of. Some people, you know, they have to work two jobs. They've got kids. They've got so much going on. So it's really rough for them and it's so hard to see. And they're doing their best to kind of learn and work on these challenges and, you know, to speak respectfully and to do all of these things. But they don't find themselves feeling any closer because there is this struggle to carve out that time. But it, it does make a difference, even just addressing some of, you know, your errands together, just finding a way to, to connect in your day-to-day -day life mm -hmm. um, or weekly. It, yeah, it, it goes a long way. Okay, let's take a quick break for today's sponsor, Book of the Month. 
Hey book lovers, struggling to find your next great read? Book of the Month is like having your own personal literary curator. Every month, their editorial team digs through hundreds of books and picks out five to seven new releases. And then you get to choose your favorite to be delivered right to your doorstep. This month, I chose The Ministry of Time by Kellyanne Bradley, which is a time travel romance, spy thriller, and comedy. What I love most about Book of the Month is that it introduces me to new and upcoming authors, and they're all hardcovers. Plus, the app makes it super easy to pick your book, track your reading progress, and listen to audiobooks as well. If you love deals like me, you'll appreciate that Book of the Month offers the best prices on new release hardcover fiction. And yes, shipping is always free. Ready to spice up your reading list? You can get your first Book of the Month for just $5 with the code PEDALS by visiting bookofthemonth.com. That's Book of the month.com with the code P-E-T-A-L-S. What are some examples of like ways that you've seen couples like improve their, the way they make time for each other? Like, are there any like tips or techniques kind of like that, that you suggest? I think people overlook their relationship because their partner's always there, Mm -hmm. right? And you're kind of living beside each other and living the same life. And that often leads to this kind of like roommate syndrome. Right, right. Um, You're too used to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I think you have to understand that just like you have, you know, working hours, you know, just like you have if you do some type of hobby and, you know, let's say you take yoga and it's scheduled at this particular time and you go once a week, you have to remember that even though your partner is always there, that doesn't mean that you are actually focused on the relationship and you're giving it the time that it needs to be nurtured, Mm -hmm. right? And so even though your partner is there, you still have to have this mentality that, hey, um, I actually have to carve out time for this thing. And I actually have to, you know, put in half an hour to have a conversation or put in half an hour to go for a walk together and to do these things where it's just us two and we're just focused on each other, about each other or, you know, whatever we're both interested in. So yeah, I, I do think it's 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 your mindset around what a relationship is supposed to be. I think the other thing with that is a lot of people expect relationships just to be really easy. Like I think I've heard the comment so many times that, you know, if it's if it's the right one, if it's perfect, it'll come easy. And that's just not always true. Um, it could be a really great relationship if you nurture it. Mm-hmm. It maybe it once was, right? The reason that it can be difficult is because you come with different experiences, you come with different stressors, um, you know, life can get rough, uh, you fall into routines, um, sometimes resentment builds, but that doesn't mean that the relationship isn't worth it or can't be good, it, but it does require work. So on to communication. I mean, what are some communication hurdles that you notice with couples and then some tips to overcome those hurdles? So that's a good one. So there's there's a few things, but um, I think the top ones that I find myself talking about almost all the time with clients is, um, I think I'll always touch in terms of generalized terms. So a lot of people don't under, it's not that they don't understand, but we all don't realize how many assumptions we make in a relationship or really in life in general, right? We make a lot of assumptions about how things are supposed to be. Sometimes it's a core belief. Sometimes it's just something we don't think very deeply about. Um, And so we'll say this very broad statement and this very general term, and we expect that someone else just knows what that means and can cater to it. Mm -hmm. And so that leads to so much disconnect. So, you know, the other partner will say like, hey, you know, I just, I wish you cared more about me. And, you know, I, I wish you showed that you cared more. Um, so, you know, partner A will say that, partner B will say, well, what do you mean? I make you breakfast every morning. <laughs> right, so like, right. You have to define it and get specific, right? Exactly. Right. Yeah. What does care mean to you? Absolutely. Yeah. And maybe partner A might've been thinking something, well, actually, you know, like I, I wanted you to call me during my lunch. Like I wish you called me, right. So that I could talk to you. Mm-hmm. Like, you actually have to say that. Like you have to, and that requires introspection, right? Right. When you, in your mind, think about what, you know, caring more means to you, what them being invested in you means to you, you have to ask those questions. Okay, what what is caring more, right? Like what is being invested in me? And you have to ask that of yourself. What would make me feel good, right? What specifically? And being able to then provide that information to your partner. The vast majority of the time, the partner, you know, Partners, like people, couples, they want to be there for each other. They want to be able to show that love of affection. The desire is there. It's just that there. that's where that miscommunication happens, right? Where it's like, okay, but this means a different thing to me than it does to you. Mm-hmm. The second thing is we 
all have such a desperate need to feel seen and heard, right? We all have this really desperate need just to feel like somebody is really witnessing our pain and our experience. And just somebody is noticing that, hey, you know, I'm going through something and acknowledging what's just been said, right? Um, so I find that normally what tends to escalate discussions um, is that, you know, a partner will come and will say something, something maybe a little bit challenging, or they'll just raise something. And when they do that, part of what they're really looking for is somebody to say like, okay, you know, thank you for sharing that with me. Um, this is what I'm hearing from you. This is what I'm seeing from you. And you took vulnerability. Oftentimes it does take vulnerability for you to share that with me. Um, but oftentimes what happens is the partner, again, partner A will say something and partner B will immediately jump to their side of the story and they'll immediately start talking about themselves. And that right there is a, is a bit of a problem oftentimes because, um, you know, partner B will now, they might've been listening, but they didn't indicate that and oh, they just start talking about themselves. Right, right. I see. And so partner, partner A will kind of get louder. Maybe they'll say, Hey, were you hearing me? They'll go back to their point. Yeah. And so that's where. And you then start no one's listening to each other. And <laughs> right. Absolutely. So you're saying it's important to like acknowledge that you heard your partner said before you move on to share your own thoughts. Cause people need to be affirmed that they are seen or, and heard. Yes, that's, that's exactly it. And I've started calling it the pause. I'm not sure if anyone else is calling it this or if there's any other terms coined about this one, Uh, but I've just started calling it the pause. Um, And so what I mean there is when somebody says something to you, literally just pause for a second and say, just acknowledge that something was said to you Mm -hmm. in in the simplest terms you can can find. And if you can't figure that out, just paraphrase, literally paraphrase, you know, what they're speaking to you and just say, okay, I'm hearing such and such. I see. Yeah. And a big trick there is that when you paraphrase, you indicate that, hey, everything you've said to me, I've actually just internalized that and I have heard you, right? Um, And knowing that now, you know, I'm going to continue this conversation. That's a really great tip. I think this works not just in a relationship, but in all your relationships, like non-romantic in life is this is just a communication skill to be able to, when someone's speaking to you to pause and to actually affirm, okay, I'm I'm hearing this. I've heard what you said and then go on to say your point, right? It's, it's something that works in all situations. Yes. Yeah. You're absolutely right. And yeah, it's, it's really great that you pointed that out. Um, yes, it's great for friendships. It's great for a work environment. I, again, people really, when they come to you, they really want to be, to know, they just want to have that normally that cue, like, Hey, you know, did you take that in? Um, and then it makes them much more receptive to you when you start to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, Yes, it's it's really applicable yeah. everywhere. And I think most of these things are. Mm-hmm. A common issue in relationships is this dynamic where let's say one of the partners refuses to like, they don't like confrontation. They don't want to talk about it, right? And what usually is like one person that wants to talk about it and talk it through and one person is like avoiding it. So what what do you recommend in that situation? What advice do you have to share? I think maybe one of the things that I would point to there is being mindful of how you approach your partner and also being mindful what comes up for you when you're having these discussions. And what you're describing is sounds really similar to off, like a common, a really common dynamic, which is when you have somebody who might be a little bit more anxious, more antsy, and they really want to address something because if they don't, then they're fearing the worst. And then you have somebody who the more pushy their partner becomes because they're getting uncomfortable, the more they feel like, okay, you're becoming overbearing and this feels threatening to me. And so I want to run away from this conversation. Mm -hmm. So being mindful of how you approach your partner, um, as well as, you know, what is coming up for you and acknowledging that, hey, this is, you've got a lot of energy there, a lot of fear, a lot of worry that belongs to you, um, that, you know, might, you might need to work through. It's a combination of those two things. But in terms of the approach, when something is bugging you and you want to talk to them about it, you really should be thinking like, okay, 
what is bothering me? Like, how is this impacting me? And really focusing on conveying your personal experience and offering information. You really, what you shouldn't be doing is you shouldn't be criticizing your partner's character Mm. when you go to them with something, right? Like what you shouldn't be doing is you shouldn't be going after who they are as a person because you're just gotten to that point where you're so frustrated and you might be, you might have have every right to be frustrated, but that's hard to receive, right? People don't, respond well to criticism, right? So, you know, instead of saying, hey, you're such a slob, like that's, you like, again, you might have built up to that after a lot of incidents and things like that, but you're not, you're going to get defensiveness. Right. Um, So instead, yeah. So instead it would be, you know, something like, hey, like I can't, I can't relax and I can't find comfort in the home when it's in such disarray. And I would really (laughs) appreciate you know, of working together to get on a schedule and to clean some of this up. And I'd really appreciate your help. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about how you frame your message. I, I, that's a really great tip. It's to not attack and criticize right away, but to share your version of the story. Yeah. I, you know, the way I would put it is you really have to focus on turning inward, right? So turn inward. What is bugging it? Where's it coming from? Um, and, you know, what, would you like to happen, right? What is it that would make you feel more cherished, more loved, more peaceful, better? You know, what is it that you are experiencing when this negative thing is happening? So turn it inward. And again, that requires self-awareness, asking these critical questions of yourself. And that's a tough skill to cultivate. Um, And then taking that and offering it as information for your partner, for them to act on it and make adjustments. And again, Most people want to be there for you. They want to offer that to you, but they need they need to have this information to make those decisions, right? Right, right. And I like that you just call it information, right? Like don't put too much emotion into it. Like take that out. You're just sharing information and then they'll they'll process that information in their own way. It doesn't have to be in the way that you want them to process it, right? Yes. And uh, and again, I, I really like that you pointed that out, actually. Um, it does, it's not about not having emotions, right? It, people do get emotional and it's, it's normal. A relationship can handle some emotions and a little bit of conflict. But it's, you know, what I like about what you said there is that component that your partner will do with that whatever they do with that. Mm-hmm. And that's really important. It's beyond your control at that point. <laughs> it's in, yes. within your control to share the information and then how they process it is on them. <laughs> Yes. Oh my goodness. Yes. And that's so important. Um, And so that requires a little bit of trust and it, it it just requires separating yourself from the outcome, right? A lot of us, uh, again, going back to maybe that more anxious person, um, leaning on that fear and that worry of, oh my God, what's going to happen? It's really working a little bit on that and trusting in your partner that they are listening, they are wanting to make changes and focusing on you to do your best, to create the best environment for them to come to you, to have these discussions, to problem solve together. Because once you've done that, then you've really done everything you could, um, but you're not kind of chasing them after, you know, chasing after them to make these changes. And so they're not feeling this, this needs to like, this, something is overbearing, something is controlling, something is too much. Right. Let's take another break for today's sponsor, AG1. As someone with a lot on her plates, I appreciate when there's a way to simplify while still being effective. Instead of mixing and matching countless supplements, I've been taking AG1 in the mornings. I love that it's a single solution that supports my entire body, delivering my daily dose of vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, and more. It's just one scoop mixed in water once a day, every day. AG1 ingredients are sourced for absorption, potency, and nutrient density. Every batch of AG1 goes through a rigorous testing process so you know you're getting safe, high-quality nutrition. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. If you want to take ownership of your health this year, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase exclusively at drinkag1.com slash lavendaire. That's drinkag1.com slash lavendaire. Check it out. Okay, the next question I have for you, which is another common issue, is what do you do when in your relationship you come across the same problem again and again, (laughs) right? Typically, it's a 
I, I just noticed this is a pattern in a lot of people's relationships where there's a problem that keeps coming up and up over and over again without any real solutions. And yet it's not big enough to like end the relationship. So it's that, so that's an interesting question. And I think it depends on the type of impact that problem is having on the relationship. Right. And there are such things as kind of unsolvable arguments in a relationship. <laughs> yeah. And so, and, and no matter which relationship, so every relationship is going to have something like that, some of them. Um, and again, the reason this happens is just different personality types, you know, um, it just different experiences and upbringing, sometimes different values. Not every value is going to be aligned. Um, so there are going to be some things that just are not going to be solved and they are going to be a component of like, oh, well, you know what? This is who my partner is, right? Mm -hmm. These are the things about them that I accept. And learning to tolerate a little bit of, you know, a little bit of not seeing eye to eye on everything, or maybe a little bit of tension, a little bit of discomfort. Mm. So again, it de- you know, to answer your question, it depends. It depends on what's going on. It depends the intensity of it. It depends on how much it's impacting the couple, and whether it's a matter of a little bit of acceptance, or it's a matter of we really need to, you know, implement change uh, in terms, in terms of bettering the relationship, right? And so when it comes to implementing change, it really is goes back to some of those communication tools we talked about. Normally, the reason it's unsolvable is because couples will be talking on top of each other. There isn't very much validation happening. There isn't very much like, hey, you know, I heard you. I understand that was your experience, you know. Um, And mind you, validation is not the same as agreeing with someone. And that's a big, important distinction that most people miss. It's just acknowledging that, hey, that's your experience, Mm -hmm. right? That's what you felt in this dynamic. So, you know, validation, I find tends to be a missing piece when couples are running in circles because it's really, you know, they'll be talking about, well, this is what I experienced. This is what I experienced. This is my side. This is your side. And again, they keep pushing and pushing and pushing, but really they each just want to know that, Hey, do you understand this is what I'm going Mm. through? Right. Mm. And maybe the last thing would be uh, just identifying what resolution means for, for each of the partners, right? Like, what are you looking for? for the resolution to be to this, right? And is that something that's reasonable and that's attainable? Yeah. And can your partner offer that? So that's usually um, the road that I take with my clients when we have these types of maybe patterns or unsolvable issues. Yeah. I mean, I like that you point out that sometimes there are unsolvable conflicts in a relationship and it's just about accepting that you agree to disagree and being okay with it. Because I think most people don't realize that's a possibility, they, right? They, they feel like, oh, we have to come to a solution. We have to come to an agreement in all cases, but sometimes it's not the case, right? Um, another thing that came to mind, another question is, it's a very common thought or piece of advice that people hear in relationships where there's like an issue is like, oh, you can't change, you can't change a person. So, but, but at the same time, we, we know that people can change. So in your perspective, how much do you agree with the, the advice that you can't change a person? And, and then the second part of that would be, what are the ingredients to change? Like after, you know, since you've seen successful change in relationships. You can't change a person. I think it's about where that person is. So it's about the willingness to change. Um, And I really think it's about where that person is on their mental health journey and what exactly you're looking to change. So certain things can be really attached to somebody's identity. Um, They can be really attached to who they believe they are as a person. Um, And they might be holding on really tight to that identity. And that's when you're going to see a lot of that resistance to change. Right. So then there's areas that are just... uh, tools, techniques, uh, things that they are more willing to implement. Um, and that's where you can see change. And so I think it, it depends, right? <laughs> Which is usually the answer to most yeah. of these questions. Um, it, it depends on where they are. It depends on what it is. Um, some people also tend to be more open, right? They are more open to having argue, you know, arguments for the sake of arguing, right? Just that intellectual back and forth. They're more open to challenging, you know, where they learn something, how they learn something, if that's really working for them. But to be fair, you have to be in a place in your life where 
you can accept that. And for again, for some people, they are in really difficult spots in their life. And you know, when you're dealing with so many stressors and you're dealing with so many things, it's hard to then also just be doing all of this internal work of, yeah. you know, needing to change yourself, change your ideologies, change what's going on, right? But to elicit change, you know, let's say we have somebody who's somewhere in the middle or more on the open side. I think it starts with kind of some micro adjustments, right? It starts in a couple, for example, it does start with some basic tools just to start changing a little bit of the patterns of the relationship. Because once you change those, you know, you start changing some of the patterns in the relationship, you start realizing that, oh, my partner can behave differently. This can look different. And so then that can lead to a little bit more openness there and mm. more willingness to to do more, uh, you know, more listening, more intervention, yeah. more, you know, uh, do things that you wouldn't have done before. Yeah, that that's great. I think what I what I'm hearing from you is that you can't change a person who is like stuck in their identity. There are some people on their mental wellness journey. They're they're just not there yet, right? They're not doing the work to excavate their inner child and, and all all of those things. So it's really hard to change if they're just not there yet in the journey. But if a person is open minded and is open to, you know challenging their beliefs and their thoughts and all of that kind of stuff then it and also open to like working together to change then that's when change is possible right yes yes absolutely yeah it's it's it really is about where somebody is i don't think that people are incapable of change right i just think that they have to kind of come to it right, right? and there has to be incentive and and it's also a little bit of a mixture of their personality and you know how what they prioritize and what's important to them yeah I think that will be helpful to some of our listeners because I know people struggle with like their relationship and wanting the it to change, but like don't not sure when, like how long to stay in it to wait for change versus like when it's like definitely not going to change. I think a lot of people struggle with that. What is your advice to people who are in a relationship where like? Should they stay or should they go? <laughs> Are there any like criteria or, you know, things that you can share? It's interesting, right? So, and you're right. It's a good segue to the previous question <laughs> uh, that you, that we just talked yeah, about. Um, some, some people can change and some, some relationships can change, but some, some are just like, there's no hope. Right. And, and some women are, you know, they might be very hopeful and they might like, not women, just some partners might be hopeful and stay hoping that things can change. But yeah, what is your criteria on that? So that's a rough one. So I think, again, something to acknowledge here is that whether a relationship is worth staying in or not is such a personal decision, right? I can tell you certain things and, you know, I will. And again, these are things that are normally kind of like researched and known. Uh, again, a lot of this research does come from Gottman and other people as well in other studies. But despite all of that, this is a personal decision, right? So, you know, may, if, if you're not feeling good in that relationship, you know, you're prioritizing your growth, you're prioritizing other things and that's not working for you or your partner is just not growing at a pace that you want them to with you or open to certain experiences or whatever it is. And you just no longer want to be in that relationship because it's not fitting for you. Um, that's enough of a reason. Whatever your reason is for wanting to move past the relationship, if, if that's where you are right now, that, that should be enough. But in general, criteria for um, a relationship that is going to be more challenging to, to navigate is usually when normally when there's a lot of resentment. Um, and normally when you think of your partner, right, and your general sentiment towards your partner is quite negative and the things that you think about them, you know, uh, you think a lot of negative qualities about them um, and those kind of outweigh the positive qualities, that's a pretty big sign. And a really big one is when you start to assume negative intent uh, behind your partner's actions, um, it means that there's the trust is quite eroded, right? And so those are usually signs that um, it's going to be difficult. It's not that it's impossible to come back from, but it's difficult, right? Because everything that your partner does, and even when they come to you with vulnerability, and that can be hard if you're already in a kind of, there's a lot of tension in the relationship. Um, if you're assuming that that vulnerability is manipulation, 
and they're out to get you and you shut it down, that, that's a really rough pattern to be in. And so that's usually where you're not going to see change. And so to see that change, you, we have to start by kind of rebuilding that trust little by little, right? There's resistance there and there's walls being put up because you are assuming that your partner is actually coming from a very negative place. You know, it's in, in session, work has to be done to create space for these couples to actually communicate, right? You have to create space for this couple, for each people, uh, each person in this dynamic to really open up and say where they're coming from and give them the space to communicate. Sometimes these couples won't even let each other speak um, because immediately they get reactive. <laughs> um, so you have to create a dynamic where you'll hear your partner say something that you've never heard them say before, usually yeah. in session. And so that can be, starts to become eye-opening, right? And so usually there is some need for mediation at this point um, to elicit any type of change because that resistance is coming from a place of the trust being worn down, right? right. And from a place of negativity built into the relationship um, and the experience of the relationship just being quite negative overall. Yeah, There's a pretty good ratio actually to keep in mind in terms of how well your relationship is doing. And it's a five to one. And so that's five positive interactions for every negative interaction. I see. And so that's really where you want to be in a healthier dynamic. Mm, no, those were really good signs. I think that makes it really clear when to know when your relationship is like not totally like, you know, negative versus where it has some, some hope. Time for another short break. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Have you ever felt like you're carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders? We all face stressors, big and small, and sometimes keeping it all bottled up starts to really wear us down. That's where therapy can make a huge difference. It's a safe space to let everything out and release those burdens that you may have. Working with a therapist through BetterHelp, I've been navigating some life changes, letting go of old versions of myself and setting a foundation for something new, healing from the past and rebuilding something better. If you're considering therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. And you can always switch therapists anytime at no additional charge. Get it off your chest with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash TLL today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash TLL. On the topic of like heated arguments, like, I mean, everyone experiences arguments or frustrating moments. What is your advice for resolving these types of arguments? Like, yeah, just give us your, your, your steps. <laughs> it's interesting because sometimes arguments can get so heated that there is no resolution to be found at that <laughs> time. Right. And this goes back to a little bit of that acceptance, right? So when an argument starts to get really far down the line, um, you're not so much trying to find resolution. At that point, you could be in a place where you're trying to do damage control. Mm -hmm. and, and so what I mean by that is you're trying to do work so that the things that are coming out of each of your mouths and, you know, the, the actions that each of you might be taking and, you know, are being minimized, right, from a negative space. Uh, because even though, you know, again, not to make relationships sound like these super fragile things, like they can withstand negativity. They can withstand, a, a good, healthy relationship will withstand some fights, some even ugly fights, right? But when you have heated arguments, sometimes you're actually switching goals from finding resolution for this particular point in time to ensuring that this doesn't make things even worse right? And so a big tip that I usually post about, and it really tends to do quite well, is taking breaks, right? So um, taking breaks in the middle of discussions. This is so important and it has to be done constructively. But what you're doing is, you know, you have two people in a discussion and they're both very escalated, right? And they're both um, they might be kind of outside of their operating window um, and they might be either, you know, hyper aroused or hypo aroused and they could be really either um, very tense and very angry or they could be shutting down. And so they're not actually in a mental space where they can have constructive discussion, they can receive feedback, they can change, you know, what they're thinking and be open to somebody. Um, and so when you reach that state, and those are usually very heated discussions, that's when you know that, hey, it's time for a break. Mm -hmm. And yeah. either one of you should initiate it when you see it in yourself. Yeah, I see. When you do take a break, it's not about storming out. That does not make it better. 
Um, especially if you have an anxious partner in the dynamic, because if you do storm out, that anxious partner is not going to relax. They're going to be fuming because now they're like, oh, they walked out on me. They're mm-hmm. never going to come back. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'm worried about their safety. I don't know where they went, whatever it is. So there is a proper way to do that, right? Um, but yes, so you know, a big tip when you do have very heated, heated discussions and arguments is you know, focus on damage control sometimes. Maybe you'll resolve it another day at another point in time. And take the breaks as you need them to come down. And usually you want at least 20 minutes. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, the next question I have is, how do you know when you've come to a healthy compromise versus overstepping boundaries or settling? Like, do you have tips for for co- making compromises? So a healthy compromise, so here's what's interesting. I talk about this a lot and this concept of reciprocity in a relationship. Reciprocity is not a tit for tat, right? It's not like you did the dishes yesterday, so I'm going to do the dishes today. It doesn't have to be an exact equal exchange, right? Reciprocity is about sticking to each person's strengths, right? And, and, and or whatever the weaknesses are. So you want to show up for your partner um, in a way that they really appreciate it, right? You want to show up for your partner in a way that's most important to them, especially if it doesn't cost you very much, but you know that it matters to them mm-hmm. and vice versa. Mm-hmm. Right. So when it comes to compromise, it's not about like checking off the list of it being exactly equal of, you know, I met your criteria for that. You wanted to do this and I wanted to do that. It's more of what are your priorities and how can I help you and adjust to your big items and your big priorities? And then what are mine and Mm -hmm. how can we focus on that? Right. And then that requires, again, it goes back to for me in session with clients, it requires a little bit of digging. Right. To discover what you need to know your right? own priorities and your own like most important needs. Yeah. And mm-hmm. sometimes people will say, well, okay, well, the fight is very, you know, it's it's one particular subject and it really gets us. Okay, but why has this become such a sore point? Mm-hmm. Meaning, like, what is driving your stance in the subject? Right? What, you know, what values is this touching on? What pain points is this touching on for each of you? And how can we navigate around those things for each of you? And usually they're not identical. So there is room there to focus on one partner. What one partner needs and then the other partner needs. Okay. So moving on to another question, this is like, we've been talking about issues and and things like that, but the next question is about the positives, right? How do you know if you're in a good relationship and it's worth working on? Like, what are the traits of a resilient relationship? It's um, friendship. Friendship is a big one. Um, So traits of a good relationship are as a relationship that you really feel that um, there's rapport between the two of you. You know each other. Again, going back to what we talked about in the beginning, you joke with each other. Those are really good signs of a healthy relationship. Being committed enough that when things go wrong, you're willing to make change. You're willing to reach out for help, right? Um, it's really hard to help or like, you know, to, to adjust a relationship because things will go wrong, even for great partners, right? Life introduces a lot of, curveballs and a lot of unknowns and a lot of challenges. So even if you're a good partnership, like things can start to go south. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's hard to address that when you are not open to receiving, you know, help or feedback. And so being willing to speak to somebody, um, being willing to actually, you know, pick up a book or something, go through some exercises together, try to change your ways a little bit. And, you know, that shows, that shows a lot of commitment and there's no there's, it, honestly, it's never too early to do something like that. Um, you can do that at any point because even if you don't have conflict, you will already know signs to look for. Uh, you already know you know how to address certain things and you'll be armed with a lot of good tools. So yeah, I would say friendship, knowing your partner, knowing them well, and that really being open to asking for help when things get a little bit tough and knowing that you know it can change. It's not the end of it. It's just your, it's your mindset around it. So, so do you have any actionables for like building stronger relationships? Like what are some, I guess, takeaways that listeners can, can practice with their, (laughs) with their partners after this podcast? Notice when your partner reaches out to you about something, right? When your partner shares interest with you, take interest in their interest Mm. because that's a, Hey, please, you know, like I want you to know me, right? I want you to know what I care about you know, create an environment, remind yourself that, hey, 
um, my partner is talking about this thing that they're passionate about. And even though I normally zone them out because I don't care, you know, I'm not passionate about that. Right. My husband, oh my God, he just... This man, like he... What is he into? What does he go off about? Everything and anything. And then particularly, so the way he thinks and the way I think are so different, right? I'm very like top down. Like I think very conceptually Uh and then I will bring it down to practical if I need to. Whereas then for him, it starts like, you know, it starts with the technicalities of everything, you know, whether it's, you know, the camera or new equipment or I don't know, a a game or anything. Like he's really into like the fidgeting and the details of something and woodworking. Like this man has so many interests (laughs) and he will start explaining to me how things go together, how they work. And like, and you're like, I don't care. Yeah, this, <laughs> I, I not only do I not care, but it like it's way over my head. Exactly. Like he's, he's got the wrong audience. <laughs> right, right. But he still wants you to listen. He wants an art audience. Yes, he does. And so, you know, I, and he knows that I'm not interested, but sometimes <laughs> I'll try. Like I'll have that conscious reminder to like, to right. the degree that I can relate to it. And yeah. of course, he'll have his friends to talk to about this stuff. But, you know, he knows that I'm not just going to shut him down or zone out or ignore him. So that's that's a really important practical tip to foster that healthy dynamic. And mm-hmm. I think we also talked about prioritizing the relationship, going, you know, learning new things together, spending time together, you know, creating room to have difficult discussions, making space for difficult discussions, doing check-ins sometimes. There's a lot of resources available for check-ins. I have one up too. Okay. So those are all things that can really help. And check-ins are really great actually, because normally uh, good check-in questions will ask uh, questions that normally wouldn't come up day to day. Mm -hmm. So it gives you an opportunity to weed out certain things that might be there, but you're not fully aware of. Yeah. Can you share what's in your check-in questions? Like what does a check-in entail? Like an ideal check-in? It essentially, it's about what what worked and what didn't work, right? So what's working and what's not working. Mm-hmm. And there's ways to ask that, right? Um, so it's like, you know, hey, what is something that I did in the past, you know, week or three weeks that you thought was really sweet and it showed you that I loved you? What is something that you really appreciated, right? And maybe the partner really appreciated, but you didn't know. Maybe mm-hmm. it was something really simple. Like, right. you know, you went and made him a cup of tea or something or her. Mm-hmm. But, you know, this doesn't come up day to day sometimes. And so when you have these types of questions, there's an opportunity to be like, oh, my partner really appreciates that. And to do, kind of focus more on that. And then same thing with things that aren't working. You know, what's something that you struggled with, right? Um, you know, what's something that you worry about more recently? And it's not always just about the relationship. Sometimes it's also just about where your partner is right now, because people can change, you know, where they are mentally and how things are going for them and how they're responding to the world around them. And not everybody is very open with that and just offers that information unless it's kind of like asked or elicited. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, Okay. Are there any final lessons or messages that you want to share with our listeners for today? Honestly, I really respect how much people are interested in developing themselves, right? Like I I really love people who are into this. I'm also one of those people, um, but I've just gained such a profound appreciation and respect to, first of all, for my clients, I, you know, I, just the fact that they show up. Um, But even as a whole, not everybody has the the resources to kind of work with somebody, but they do their own kind of research Mm -hmm. and they try to find reputable sources and they try to find ways to learn, to, 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 to build a healthy dynamic. And I find that relational awareness and, you know, um, kind of emotional awareness as well, isn't very strong across the board, but people, it seems like there's a move to change that. Right. So it's, to me, it's really great to see that. And it's really exciting. And I love, you know, the commitment people have to learning more about themselves and learning more about how to be in a, in a healthy dynamic in a relationship, but also with, with anyone. And so, yeah. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. No, it definitely does. And well, because I'm always talking about like working on yourself, but hearing your perspective on working in relationships, it seems like like relationships are also great. Obviously they're great teachers, but a lot of the work is in a relationship is also work with yourself. (laughs) It's like understanding yourself, understanding your needs, and then understanding your partner and their needs. And then it's, it's kind of like the next level where you kind of like put it together and make it work, (laughs) but it, it is so much inner work. 
Yeah, you're absolutely right. And that's a great observation, right? A relationship is like such, I don't know, for lack of better words, like fertile ground for development. Yeah. Especially because your partner can sometimes call you out on oh, yeah. things that you might not be seeing about yourself. <laughs> oh, totally. Right? They're and like your mirror that shows everything, <laughs> the good and yes, the bad. <laughs> and yeah. And so there's less room there for, you know, dancing around what yeah. could be going on and why this is a problem and how mm-hmm. people are treating you and especially with certain core beliefs, right? So um, it's I feel like it's almost accelerated, exactly. right? Because you might have, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think, yeah, it's it's... It's a really cool, like, growing opportunity. And you'll hear such amazing things either about your partner or yourself that you might not have have heard before. Yeah. All right, Yola. Um, Lastly, where can we find you online? You can find me on my social. So I'm on primarily on Instagram and TikTok. So it's my first name dot my last name, so Yola.Yowani. And you can find me on my website. So it's jointrealitymedia.com. So that would be, yes, that's where you can, you know, find the quizzes and the, you know, the free resources or, you know, work with me uh, and things like that. Um, I'm working on publishing a course soon and as well as we also have a physical book coming out. So very exciting stuff happening. And so that would be, that would be a great place to connect. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge today. I'm sure everyone was inspired to work on having healthier relationships in their lives. So thank you. Thank you so much, Eileen. You've been absolutely lovely. And, you know, I love all the insightful questions that you asked. Um, it's, it's been a great conversation. 